Um, so good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. It's great to see so many of you join us here today. And I see those numbers going up um, as you're coming online. Um, my name is Gemma Davis. I'm a senior research fellow at the Humanitarian Policy Group, um, ODI, and I lead our portfolio of work on protection. Today, we're delighted to be co-hosting this event with the Center for Civilians in Conflict, and we'll be discussing community engagement with armed actors, strengthening protection, prevention, and response. Here at HPG, we're just beginning a new two-year research project, uh, considering the opportunities, challenges, risks of complement, more complementary approaches across peace, humanitarian and protection responses to support communities in their engagement with armed actors for their self-protection. And why this focus? Um, as has been referred to in many of the events this week, civilians are not just passive actors in conflict, but use their agency, including to engage with, with armed actors for self-protection. Community engagement with armed actors often takes place significantly before any externally supported um, mediation or negotiation processes. And the interaction between civilian communities and armed actors is complex, at times ambiguous and changes through time. So there's growing recognition and momentum on the need for a shift in approaches to protection, including approaches to prevention of threats and in considering how civilian engagement strategies can be supported or at the very least not undermined. Peace actors often engage with threats, including through supporting engagement, dialogue and negotiation with armed actors, though not necessarily through the lens of protection. And when considering approaches to prevention, there's a growing recognition and willingness to build a community of practice between humanitarian protection and peace actors, and to consider opportunities to bridge approaches between the sets of actors. And by having greater analysis of community engagement with armed actors and positive strategies for self-protection, the implications um, for humanitarian protection and peace actors will be a central focus of this research. So with that in mind, um, we're delighted to convene this dialogue between a panel of experts across humanitarian protection and peace action, who will speak to the practical experience of their organizations when supporting community engagement strategies. Our first panelist today, Lee Mayhew, is a research officer at ODI, um, who's been supporting us on the scoping of this research, and he'll present the outcome of the scoping study of the research I just referred to. Over to you, Lee. Great. Thank you, Gemma. Um, as part of the inception phase of the two-year project that Gemma was just referring to, um, we carried out a scoping exercise, uh, which reviewed the existing evidence and carried out expert consultations. So what did we find? So firstly, in terms of looking at the role civilians play, civilians adapt their strategies of self-protection based on the type of armed actor that they're facing. Strategies adopted by civilians include flight, opposition, accommodation, engagement, and collaboration. They'll also leverage the presence of multiple armed actors to improve their security. Civilian perceptions of protection may differ to those of international actors. Whilst the latter may focus on the standards defined by international law and access to rights, we found that customary law, local values, norms can matter at times more than formal rights. It's also important to recognise that civilians are not a homogenous category. A range of local actors, including traditional, religious and business leaders, elders and community-based organisations, often lead engagement on behalf of their respective community. Understanding who is leading and present during negotiations is important as these factors will determine what concerns are prioritised. Moving on to what factors help to determine um, the engagement process between civilians and armed actors. Firstly, although external support um, can improve the effectiveness of community engagement, it is important to recognise that there are certain conditions that will influence the parameters of engagement. This can include the motivation behind the use of violence, group ideology, and the level of concern that an armed actor has for its legitimacy. All these will determine the boundaries of engagement. With this in mind, community engagement with armed actors is not, um, is not static. It is influenced by community dynamics, uh, so excuse me, it's influenced by conflict dynamics, which can have both positive and negative effects. For example, firm territorial control and the change in leadership can result in a more conducive engagement process. The level of internal community cohesion and capacity can also be a key factor in effective engagement for self-protection. Strong customer organization, a high level of internal unity 
and pre-existing respected local in, uh, institutions and leadership can all improve the effectiveness of community engagement with armed actors. Also, the distinction between civilian and armed actors isn't always clear. Pre-existing relationships based on kinship, family and political interests often exist between the two sets of actors. This may offer civilians the advantage of trust over external actors when engaging with armed actors. However, these factors are not uniform. We found that while in some cases close bonds proved effective, in others it was the position of neutrality. And finally, focusing on what opportunities exist for external actors, while there is this growing acknowledgement of the role of conflict affected communities in securing their own protection, plus this increased consideration and piloting by humanitarian protection and peace actors in supporting community engagement with armed actors, a number of these practices are relatively new um, and undocumented. There is also inertia to a more systemic uh, shift within the humanitarian sector. Concerns over neutrality, tensions between international principles and frameworks and local norms and customs, engagement with prescribed armed groups and top-down approaches all remain obstacles to a more community-driven engagement response. A deeper understanding of the risks and protection needs plus at times a greater degree of trust with armed actors, mean that civilians are often better placed than external actors. However, this does not mean that there is no role for external actors to play. Local strategies rarely provide the degree of protection uh, needs that are required by civilians. A complementary approach is required, strengthening local capacities for self-protection while at the same time generating international political will to a more systemically engage uh, in prevention of threats is needed. The key takeaway from the research is that whilst there is a role for humanitarian protection and peace actors to, to play, any strategy should be community led. This means identifying where existing engagement is taking place and look to support it rather than replace these mechanisms. And finally, of importance to our research, We've identified that currently there is little to no research exploring the opportunities and challenges for greater synergies between humanitarian protection and peace actors in relation to the community engagement for self-protection. As such, this will be the core focus of our research. Thank you. Great. So, thanks very much, Lee. Um, and I think it's really important to, there's some really interesting points there on the fluidity of community armed actor relations and the grey area between what are civilians and armed actors need, you know, really pointing to the need for a sort of in-depth localised conflict analysis uh, prior to considering any engagement by, by um, external actors. Um, and the need for greater synergies, which takes us um, straight on to introducing our next panellist. So Wendy McClinty um, is the UN Director of Centre for Civilians in Conflict. Um, and Wendy will then hand over to Clement Gbede. Sorry if I didn't pronounce that very well, Clement, uh, representing one of CIVIC's partners from the West Africa Network for Peacebuilding. Clement will offer an operational perspective. Um, and Wendy will tell us about CIVIC's civil society toolkit, uh, the guidance it gives, and how it's being used by CIVICs and its partners. Clement will offer an operational perspective on its use in Niger and the Sahel. So, Wendy, over to you. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. It's an absolute pleasure to be with you all today. Um, my name is Wendy McClinchy. I'm the director of Civic's UN program. Um, Civic is an uh, organization which is devoted to the protection of civilians in armed conflict, uh, both operationally with um, research uh, and engagement with armed actors and with communities, uh, and also at the policy level as well. Um, today, I wanted to just uh, give you a quick um, overview of the First of all, the value of civil society as a starting point, and then a, and then a couple of words on the new civil society toolkit that Civic has just uh, recently launched. I mean, first we've seen time and again as. Um, as colleagues uh, have said in the opening how valuable uh, an active role of civil society is in shaping both protection policies and practice you know from one side bearing witness to the experience of civilians and calling for specific protection needs from armed actors to exercising oversight of both military and security actors we've seen how constructive and meaningful and especially not extractive engagement between armed actors and civil society can improve protection practices and outcomes. 
So in Ukraine, for example, local CSOs have played a crucial role in not just providing a humanitarian response, but in filling the gaps and addressing the needs on protection of civilians uh, in which local authorities, defense and security forces and other actors weren't able to cover uh, on their own. Um, local civil society, in addition to NGOs, includes volunteers, community-based initiatives, local activists and opinion leaders, in many cases, these are the only ones who can access civilians who really do need protection, including some of the most vulnerable groups. Um, they can help those with disability, the elderly, um, and others who, for whom access is a, a challenge. Um, this can be in help with evacuation, in ensuring food security, in supplying medicines or providing psychosocial assistance. We've seen in the Ukraine um, context that civil society has shown a very quick and decisive and flexible response. And this was really possible due to the existing direct communications between people uh, in the affected communities and their trust uh, towards civil society actors with, who really do have quite a profound uh, local knowledge of needs and access points and continuous on the ground presence and access to hard to reach communities, including those under direct attack. So on the toolkit we've developed, um, it provides concrete guidance to communities and stakeholders and was piloted in Ukraine and Niger and is now being piloted in Indonesia, the UK and in Estonia. Uh, it's a resource for civil society actors, which draws from practical experience, both sources in international law and best practice. The goal is really to provide these uh, civil society and local actors from different sectors, whether it's humanitarian, human rights, uh, peace building, and local organizations, really with a common language and a common basis to work together to diagnose needs and come together for a, a shared set of actions. Quite often we see that states are keen to distinguish themselves, whether or not they often, whether or not they comply with international humanitarian law. But we know from experience that um, compliance isn't always the most effective incentive uh, for really changing practice. And really by comparing and exchanging best practice um, and addressing some of the most critical protection needs, uh, we can see that there's a, that there are other opportunities to engage. So we, the framework, the toolkit uh, includes a, an evaluation framework which comprises several categories um, and subcategories that, that um, civil society actors can use to evaluate the level of engagement and performance um, of security actors. These include four categories. The first is on national commitment and enabling environment. So these have to do with the laws and policies and other political areas. Um, do they engage with international human rights bodies? Are there independent oversight of security institutions? Are there national laws that allow for civic um, and civilian participation in public policy making, including in security policy? Um, the second is preventing and mitigating harm. So this has to do with planning and operations. What are the standards for the rules of engagement uh, in the use of force by security actors? Is there specific guidance on targeting, on assessing civilian objects? Is civilian harm mitigation built into military training modules? Do security forces engage communities uh, on their own protection concerns and do they apply a do no harm approach? The third area is civilian harm response. This has to do with reporting, investigations, tracking and recording. Do they use civilian harm tracking? Are there systems for public oversight and transparency of civilian harm? Are there systems and processes to account for the dead, injured, and missing? Um, and there, are there credible uh, investigations into instances of harm? The final area is around amends and reparations, uh, which has to do with harm that results from lawful or unlawful conduct, including expressions of condolence. So for example, are there public acknowledgement uh, on, of harm? Are there policies which govern victim-centered condolence payments? And are there claims for, are there, is there a claims process for reparations for the victims of IHL violations and, and access to information on remedies? as well as criminal, uh, criminal systems to hold perpetrators accountable for international crimes. Um, so for example, our partners, uh, WANA, um, will speak um, next on some of the implications of this, um, of, of this practice. Um, there they chose, in Niger, they chose to focus on the legal and policy frameworks for Niger, while in Indonesia, they're looking at community engagement and civil military relations um, in Papua.
before the Russian invasion, our Ukraine team had worked with the Ukrainian Red Cross to assess opportunities for improving community protection. The second part of the toolkit is an advocacy guide, which really takes um, actors through each stage of this collective advocacy strategy, but and allows it to be tailored to the unique needs of protection agendas. Um, so we know that uh, no tool is going to solve uh, uh, and overturn all of the invisible and explicit restrictions placed on civil society that can prevent local organizations from playing these roles. But one theme that has come up again and again is that each restrictive environment, in each restrictive environment in which we've worked uh, and our partners have is that civil society is much more powerful um, when they work together for common outcomes. And because tools are only as good as their implementation, uh, I'd like to turn the floor over to Clement Coco uh, Gbede, uh, the National Coordinator for the West Africa Network for Peacebuilding, uh, WANEP, uh, which is focused on protection, peacebuilding, and human rights uh, in Niger. Over to you, Clement. Thank you very much, Wendy. So I'm here to talk about how we used the assessment toolkit to see how to bring community actors to engage with armed actors for their own protection. And this has led us to see how we could start a dialogue between the two uh, uh, stakeholders and to see which strategies and factors have uh, allowed or prevented this protection. So we want to see the engagement of community and of armed actors to strengthen the outcomes of protection. And I will talk about how to support the actors of protection and of peace building. So we are in a context where uh, sa safety concerns are growing, violence against civilians. So in this fragile context, it contributes to the intensification of the conflicts and of insecurity and violence towards civilians. We also have an intensification of the safety response of armed group activism that have created many incidents. So how to engage the community for their protection? First and foremost, we have to say that the only reason why the communities and the armed groups need to uh, be committed in order to have a fight a good response is based on the uh, the terrible consequences of the actions of these armed groups. It may have a huge impact and dire consequences for the local communities, and. Consequently, it's important to have um, a dialogue between the armed groups and the community. So it's, it's crucial in order to have uh, our activities there. So first and foremost, we need to have a dialogue so we can get a safe access to these communities and to these peoples who are living on the same area as those armed forces. And we also understand that it's thanks to this dialogue that we can make sure that it can uh, everyone can understand and we need to need to ensure that and guarantee the safety of these communities and is with this dialogue that we can promote the uh, humanitarian law and the international law and all the um, legal tools so the so once again, the communities are at the core of the activities. So let's move on to the strategies and the uh, the many obstacles. So, so the context is very difficult for the, the commitment of uh, the engagement of your communities because we have violence against populations and we we have a uh, forced displacements of populations and it has a huge impact on the traditional structures and the the customary uh, mechanisms in the communities themselves. So we need to use this framework in order to have a, a civilian uh, military uh, collaboration, because in this framework, we need to have um, sit around the table with the many stakeholders and the actors, the non-state actors 
and we need to sit around the table with them in order to to uh, define indicators and which will favor the uh, collaboration one of the important and potential factors so for example you have uh, a leader of a militia or a leader a leader of armed groups so no one no one's being sued for everything they've done so they're not held accountable so and this is why it's really becoming very difficult to have a collaboration in Niger, for example, and even in the Sahel region. So most of the time we have uh, communities with their own structures, and this is one of the potential factors in order to have a, a, an efficient protection. So, so we have to work on prevention and a mitigation of risks. And this is why, with thanks to uh, the collaboration with the civilians, we wanted to, to draft a, an action plan and we also wanted to have an advocacy guidebook. Okay, so as I was saying, so in the, uh, the assessment framework, so we uh, focused on the political dimension because we, the President of the Republic, is he's a man and he's a leader. And he funded the whole his, his action based on the protection of civilians against violence, and that was something important because he helped us with to to get organised with the uh, civil society. So we are uh, creating an advocacy that we want to have in the parliament, so we can have uh, an abdo uh, to draft and to vote a law for the protection of civilians, and also with the institutions and with the military. So we have a commitment and, and we have an, an influence. But uh, unfortunately, there's still some, an element of distrust of the civil society uh, against these um, these armed um, groups and the military, because unfortunately, the, uh, the, mili the, the army is not held uh, liable for everything that may happen or things that may do against the, the populations. So. So these are the many factors in order to have an efficient protection of uh, civilians. And this is why we need to take some time to draft a common agreement, a common action plan with the many stakeholders. So, and furthermore, it's important to see how the uh, protection stakeholders are need uh, to create dialogue with the people at risk and to make sure that all these people at risk can participate fully to these activities. So we need to define their needs, to we need to plan, and we need to uh, design a protection activities and to do a follow-up on these activities and to have a, a correct assessment of their, uh, the outcomes. So what's important is so we need to make sure that uh, all the, the bad things that may have happened previously should not happen ever again. So this is why we have a pretty efficient framework in Niger and we uh, we see that our oh, things are improving and, and before the law uh, is voted and comes into force in order to protect uh, the f civilians in our country. So we'd like to thank you for your attention. Many thanks, Clement, and for your patience with uh, with having your connectivity in and out there. Um, but but thanks so much for for both of your interventions, when, Wendy and Clement. I think it's really interesting to see sort of not only the framework um, that that Civic's been working with partners with, but also how that's been playing out in practice. And I think you know your points on the need for trust, for dialogue uh, and, and communities at the core with full participation um, in order to promote protection outcomes is, is absolutely key. Um, our next panelist is Mike Jobbins, who is the Global Affairs and Partnerships Lead at Search for Common Ground, an international peace building NGO. So maybe from a peace perspective, Mike, you can let us know um, what mechanisms you use for community um, self-protection and, and what external actors need to consider when working with such mechanisms. Yeah, thanks a lot, Gemma. And it's really wonderful uh, to be here with you and, and, um, and everyone uh, on the call. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, Search for Common Ground, we're one of the world's largest uh, peace building organizations. We have about 60 offices across the Americas, Europe, Africa, the Middle East and Asia. 
I think we work in all of the countries uh, that are I, I see being introduced in the chat, and I'd love to to keep connected uh, with all of you, uh, and for my colleagues around the world too, um, as well. Uh, at our at the core of our work, uh, we're fundamentally a global but decentralized organization that's quite rooted in the local communities uh, that we serve, and, and with a mission of supporting healthy, safe, and just societies. And that's led us uh, over the the four decades uh, that we've been in existence to increasingly work with protection actors, with humanitarian actors, uh, as well as uh, the community, civil society, faith groups, governments, to see how uh, to better uh, reduce the threat of violence and improve social cohesion uh, in all of those, those places. And uh, as we design our interventions, uh, Gemma, uh, you, know, you alluded to our, uh, some of our toolkit but we also uh, keep that grounded in um, the philosophy that you can't start with what you don't have. And so when we're designing a program to prevent violence or, or improve protection outcomes, we always begin with an inc uh, appreciative inquiry approach and, and looking at what there is uh, within each country and, and what are the assets was working well um, already as civilians are navigating uh, incredibly complex, challenging and threatening uh, security um, environments. Um, to your question, Gemma, about sort of interventions and, and where we see a, a real evidence base um, around what works in um, supporting civilian engagement uh, with armed actors, I'd like to point to, to five uh, types of interventions that I think there's a pretty broad and strong evidence base for from the peace building community. The first um, is the creation of peace committees. Many of you will be fa uh, familiar with um, this track record. There's a uh, pros and cons in different deployments, but it's one of the best known um, and, and most common. I'd, I'd point at, for example, in the Central African Republic, a country uh, that has perhaps a thousand, uh, 2000 villages, um, there's a thousand peace committees uh, out of the 2000 villages. It's been widely adopted uh, first and foremost by the Central African people. 80% um, of, of those committees receive no international support, um, but for international actors, there's a strong uh, evidence base and, and we can point to some of our own studies of uh, of those groups really being particularly effective in preventing mass atrocities and engaging with armed groups and encouraging a demobilization of, of uh, anti block or, or and um, and select combatants um, and exit from armed groups or, or the prevention of particular uh, forms of abuse. Uh, the second intervention I'd, I'd point to would be early warning and early response systems. Uh, we support those in, in South Sudan, Nigeria, DRC, Mali, and a number of other places. Um, and what's common across all of those is community-based uh, multi-stakeholder efforts that have the ability uh, to signal and bring in the appropriate authorities and the appropriate protection actors uh, to raise the alarm when threats are emerging. Uh, the third, I'd highlight media interventions. Um, we know we produce uh, radio, uh, we use WhatsApp, we use television, we use uh, new uh, technologies to engage armed actors and to sensitize as well as uh, shape attitudes towards civilians. We know, for example, from defectors that three quarters of Boko Haram combatants in Niger uh, from interviewing defectors listen to our radio programs. And there's a tremendous ability to shape how armed groups behave at an individual and group level. I'd allude, uh, I think similar to civic and some of the things that Wendy um, was highlighting, we support uh, security force training. We have seen at least an, a strong evidence base on a behavioral change work with police, with um, soldiers often at the point of deployment. In addition to some of the more classroom style IHL trainings in Congo, we've seen a 20% increase in um, uh, public safety uh, where there's been that kind of in-situ training um, for deployed units, uh, deployed FARDC units in that context. And then finally, I'd point to conflict scans, sort of the just-in-time light touch analysis to inform not only protection actors, but also wash, uh, shelter, um, food security, and particularly in the context of like IDP returns or internationally facilitated returns on emerging protection risks that go beyond um, sort of the, the desktop uh, conflict assessments that that are often you know 60 pages 100 pages and six months too late um to really get that just in time uh, information on the changing context uh, to the um uh, to the front line uh, humanitarian workers and protection actors government agents uh, uh, Gemma, on your question about the recommendations i, I would and what we've learned i'd, I'd highlight three c's uh, capa uh capabilities continuity and collaboration on the capabilities 
as more and more humanitarian organizations look at the HDP nexus, I really question all of us to think about how we take the P, the peace building element seriously within that nexus. Um, whether or not uh, you know, that is, is its own field of knowledge is one we've been very involved in. And I'd encourage humanitarian groups to think about how they build partnerships with local actors, with international actors, what kind of capabilities they want in-house as they engage on the peace, uh, the peace side of things, because it's a context where it's incredibly easy to do harm in, in this space. Um, and, and usually that kind of capability needs to go beyond just sort of one peace advisor or one sort of consultant um, to, to really build out that in-house capability or the strategic partnerships. The second on continuity, it's very rare that we've seen one approach a work in a tremendously complex environment, just a peace committee approach or just security force training. And thinking about how you bring that sort of wrap around a support of analysis, um, some sort of what we call key people and more people, some direct engagements, some support to explicit dialogue efforts and negotiations, some uh, mass engagement, um, usually for in our case through, through media um, or, or other kinds of mass gatherings um, in a way that takes a more holistic approach um, to uh, reducing the threat of, of violence and harm against civilians. And then finally, on collaboration, this is a space with a tremendous amount of opportunity to learn uh, and to learn across sectors, uh, across organizations working in a single uh, geographic area. And so I'd point people uh, to uh, the Connexus platform. For those who aren't familiar, it's one that we've begun using quite a lot. It's uh, cnxus.org. I'll drop it in the chat. But it's a tremendous opportunity for both local uh, actors around the world, but also humanitarians, peace building and, and, and development practitioners to share learning material, to participate in webinars and to, to sort of cross fertilize and cross pollinate um, so that we can all work a little bit together, better together in order to respond to sort of the holistic nature of the threats that communities uh, uh, face and the single lived experience of, of an individual, of a woman living uh, or a man living in conflict zone to bring that holistic response to, to sort of what is one human life and one human um, uh, experience of uh, of both actual harm as well as uh, as well as the threat of harm that we're uh, all looking to to prevent. So thank you so much. I'll drop some links in the chat. I'd love to keep connected to all of you. Uh, I'm Mike Jobbins on Twitter. Mike Jobbins on LinkedIn, um, and I'll drop my uh, email in the chat. But but thanks so much for having me, Gemma. Thanks, Mike. Um, and also big shout out to Mike, who is calling in from DC at an awful time in the morning. So um, real commitment there. Thank you so much. Love to start my morning with you. <laughs> um, but I think it's really important. And, and this is exactly where some of the sort of conversations and building a community of practice that you know, we're we're looking to work together with with practitioners and, and operational partners. But is it that recognition that there is so much happening in these um, in the peace space that can be learned from the in the humanitarian space and vice versa? Um, so I think a really good um, call to action on um, taking the P um, part seriously. Um, and and yeah, and I think it's a really good reminder on that sort of you know you can't. Start with what we don't have, um, and that everything needs to be grounded um, in what's going on in the community, what's working, what's not. And there's not a sort of one size fits all approach. It has to start from from there. And I think this is where there's some real opportunities for the humanitarian community to to learn from uh, from what the peace community have been doing for for many years. As have some parts of the humanitarian community, but it's also a little bit more of a growing um, practice. I think on that sort of prevention and addressing, as you say real threats. Um, to now pass over to um, our next panelist, Kieran Kothari from Save the Children, who heads up the Civ, uh, Civil Military Relations and Access Unit. So Kieran, um, you've recently carried out research in Colum Colombia and South Sudan, along with NRC. Um, so it'd be great if you could tell us a bit about the findings, what it means for Save the Children's and a broader set of humanitarian and, and other actors approaches to negotiations and supporting communities in those negotiations. Over to you. Thanks, Gemma, and thanks uh, to all my colleagues uh, speaking before. It's really, it's really uh, helpful to hear the reflections from everybody uh, kind of on this. I'll just take a couple of seconds to, to sort of speak about how we're, how we're structured and where, where we kind of started from. Uh, so I work with a unit of, of expert colleagues who, do, who help us do research and 
and think about our field practice. And we also support our, our field colleagues with, with kind of humanitarian negotiations, with the negotiations that we carry out. But then um, it was almost a couple of years ago. Um, it's it's like twenty two months ago. I was I was just thinking about it now that we uh, that me and a couple of colleagues sat down and thought about what would we like to do, um, or how could we be better at this and more effective. And we were coming at it from two angles. One was you know the fact that we'd done a lot of work on community child protection, and then uh, we were also looking at how could we be more locally led in in crisis. And uh, we have a, a, a lot of frontline staff. And how does how does that kind of look? So if we move to the next slide, um, and then you know there you know it's it's really we we thought you know where can we do research? And I'll I'll come to the other locations where we've also been working. Um, but what we're really hoping was to was to see and learn from our frontline colleagues and NRC's frontline colleagues. We had this discussion. Uh, we made a proposal to uh, the Swedish government for some funding to to really help us uh, think this through. Um, and really, what we were able to do is, you know, we found certain things that are in line with with a lot of research that's been done before, but consistent, but also more nuanced for our and NRC's uh, work. And I'll speak mostly to to our work and what we've what we as say the children found. One is that you know. Uh, leaders are less likely to engage in negotiations when there are externals present who are doing the same thing. So, for us, that means you know how do we how do we accommodate ongoing negotiations that are fruitful and not undermine others? That's that's one big kind of reflective takeaway for us with our practice. Then another thing is you know this this idea of social cohesion it depends on location, context, region. Like you know um, like our colleagues have just been saying now very, very context specific, you know, it also, the need for that localized context analysis, and that fits very well with the, the preparatory work that you do before you're negotiating, right? You, uh, you kind of analyze the context, you analyze the network of influence around your negotiation counterpart, and then you can build these relationships and see where that space is. So there's a bridge there between the negotiations that we do as humanitarians and dialogue with communities. Then you know we found that younger participants are more likely and willing to work collectively with their community, and community leaders have greater trust for other community or you know in and from other community members. Uh, next slide, please. Then you know it's about um, the perceptions. Ensuite, of il s'agit de la perception de de la privation et de l'insécurité. Les femmes ont rapporté d'être plus en insécurité que les hommes. Euh, L'inverse, pardon. Les hommes ont rapporté se sentir moins en sécurité que les femmes. Euh, Donc, vous voyez un petit peu euh, ce qui ce puzzle. Like, you know, how do you feel safe versus, you know, what's the characteristics that a community is experiencing of, of their situation and capacity? So really, you know, you, this need for nuanced uh, context analysis is really important. Can we go to the next slide, please? Um, so we came up with a tool and this tool was also presented in a session on Wednesday morning. So I urge you all to, to really look at that. Uh, that session and what we've done with the tool this this kind of goes to our, our kind of bridging between um, the practice of humanitarians as an entity and then the practice of communities as an entity and here I think you know how do you how would you really look at this in terms of the accommodation of of communities versus you know the need to drive humanitarian action forward as well there can be There's, there's a need for uh, greater coordination and not displacing others kind of ongoing negotiations. And then how do we, how do we work with existing groups? And then I'll come to the final slide, um, which, is, which is basically, you know, what are we doing next? Now that we've, we've thought a little bit about this and we've been learning and working, and then we tried to work with our own staff on the front lines and with partners. So last year in Mali, we had sessions where we brought together our frontline staff and partners 
to, to work on humanitarian negotiations. And what we found is that practically you do need separate spaces to, to kind of work and skill up and practice those skills. So for your organization and its mandate, and then also for um, other organizations, but then it's also important to come together and share this analysis. And that's that was a really hard practical lesson that we learned. It was, it was really difficult in that session, but then we found that we built really good relationships and it really deepens our trust and understanding. Next thing that we found is, you know, we are, we as Save the Children, we focus on education and protection, including child protection and healthcare. And then how do we build this forward? So really in each of those negotiations, we've, we, uh, we often build or, or set up or work with existing structures in those communities. And this is where we, where we kind of talk about um, education dialogue, so safe schools uh, guidelines implementation. We work with safe schools committees made up of teachers and some students. And how do we, how do we build that forward? With our community child protection systems, we're working a lot with those structures. And then in healthcare, you know, you're working with um, the communities and also with kind of healthcare act. So how are we looking at pediatric healthcare and emergencies and how can we learn and make sure that we're recognizing the goal of, of communities in that? So really what we want to do now moving forward is, is to adapt our tools both for our own normative dialogues and at the same time to kind of find spaces where we where we cooperate much more effectively with with communities. And in there is a really good balance. So I've I'll, I'll stop there and then maybe take some more some more questions when we come back to it. Thanks. Thanks very much, Kieran. Um, and I think really interesting findings of your uh, of of the research that you carried out there. And um, again, sort of hearing on ensuring interventions don't undermine community capacity. Uh, you know that that need for local level nuanced analysis and really learning from existing dialogue. I think these are sort of quite common themes that are coming out um, in our event today, but have also been coming out um, across the week. And I think a really interesting point on who is best placed and willing to engage in dialogue and this point that you found on sort of interesting to note that sort of youths were at times better placed or more willing. Um, I think, you know, these are sort of the, the very granular analysis that's uh, that's needed in order to um, consider where external actors can engage um, in, in negotiation and mediation. Um, before we go to our next uh, panelist, I'd like to open the floor um, to encourage the audience, not verbally, um, but to send in any relevant questions in the chat. Um, and after Nils has spoken, we can then um, start going into a Q&A. So please do use the chat function. Um, to put in any questions, any any comments. Um, so to go to our next panelist, uh, Nils Carstensen, who is the founder and co-director of Local to Global Protection um, and has worked in humanitarian crisis response um, since the 1980s. Um, Nils, having worked across the humanitarian conflict transformation, transition to peace type initiatives for a number of years, what do you think are the most important considerations for external actors to consider when supporting community-led approaches, including engagement with armed actors to strengthen protection outcomes? I think, again, this is one of these questions that I would really all um, only want to answer in context. And, and so, but from the very few contexts that I happen to have been privileged enough to to, to work with, with local and national colleagues and help do joined up research uh, in those places, what I've seen is um, it's, it's the standing back. It's our ability to stand back. It's our ability not to, not to I was just going to use a swear word, but I'm not, but not ruin things, not get in the way, not suck all the oxygen, the energy and the, and the initiative out of what might already be happening. Um, so I, the first step for me is this very, very granular understanding of what is already happening. Is there actually a need for you? And, and I'll give you one example from one particular part of Sudan. I will not say which particular part of Sudan right now because of the situation in that country, in many parts of that country, but 
in one particular part of Sudan, we've had for more than 10 years now, about 1 million people trapped in, in, in a sometimes intense, sometimes less intense conflict zone. That area has been, for a large part of that time, cut off from the rest of the country and from the neighboring countries. With that, within that particular context, and, and I'm, I'm talking about things now that I've just observed. This is all activities done by local conflict transformation and, and, and peacemakers with smart, sensitive, and very limited, really, uh, support from outside actors who understood the need for them to take a back seat, but be there with those needed resources, with that extra knowledge, et cetera, et cetera, networking, advocacy, et cetera. But what we found in that particular area a, a couple of years ago was interesting also into your discussion here, I think, because the activities of these local peace actors, I mean, a lot of it builds on networks and relationships that crisscross ethnic and political divides. Some of these con connects are very personal, very individual. Um, and some of them go back 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, old schoolmates, people you worked with in the same organization, but now happen to be on it. So it's a very, it's, it's a very sort of granular and personal and multifaceted network of individuals on both sides of the front line that have managed to time and time again, negotiate access routes for humanitarian assistance where humanitarian assistance would otherwise simply not come. And here I'm uh, quoting Verbatim, one of the community leaders. Another, I think, hugely important thing we saw when we started digging into the nitty gritty of it, that this peace and conflict transformation from the very beginning had a very clear focus on trying to reestablish the traditional trade and exchange patterns across the front line, but at a very, very local level almost in hiding. And, and they've succeeded and have sustained over six, seven, eight years enough of these so-called sort of sometimes moving, sometimes canceled and then reopened peace markets to enable a situation where you, when you visit this area today, you are seeing goods there that were not there during a previous conflict. Absolutely not there. So basic commodities like fuel, um, salt, foodstuff, etc., makes it way, its way through these peace markets, which is in the best interest of everybody on both sides of the front line. So it pays into some commercial interest. It pays into the interests of the population. Not only does it mean there's an influx of essential goods, there is an outflux of livelihoods, which is being sold out, which is the traditional trading pattern in the area. So we could only guesstimate, but within just a year, about at least $20 million worth of goods were being exchanged. Now that's huge in a humanitarian context where people were uh, very, very poorly off and where the humanitarian access was limited. So the humanitarian assistance was limited from a protection point of view, this also means that there was opening up channels for people to move so people could access services across the front line, not for combatants, of course. So just a whole set of things that follows from, from this work done by local peacemakers, leaders, and, and in a manner so that it has been sustained. Every market has its own committee that brings together traders and officials from both sides. And of course, this could not happen unless armed actors who are the ones who hold sort of the day, the sway in the area on the day, were informed and somehow consented it. That didn't mean that the government consented to it. But, but local armed groups, opposition groups, but also lo local armed groups, militia groups that usually would be loyal to the government, saw that it was in their best interest to keep this going. So this is actually, when we looked at it, I had to just as a humanitarian stand back and say, wow, this 
work, which has been funded with next to nothing compared to the humanitarian interventions, has paid off probably more so in humanitarian dividends than all of our human, combined humanitarian efforts. It, 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 it really, it blew me off my feet. Um, what was interesting to this discussion also was, particularly the peace actors from outside who were supporting and funding it, and some of them possibly on this call today, they were not really aware of this humanitarian impact. They were, they were focused on their lock frames, of their sort of immediate peace conflict transformation um, indicators, but never paid, I think, sufficient just importance to this huge protection. And just the, the level of reduction of violence was a huge protection outcome. It, it could change, but if you look at it over 10 years that they've been able to manage this and reduce significantly was, was, I think, super interesting. And if you'd allow me, and that would be my last point, I'll leave that case and then just move on to, to what we so, sometimes refer to as the survivor and the community-led crisis response, which is more just about how, how can we as insight system actors support all of the mutual efforts, all of the local agency that is happening out there. And, and some of you may have heard of this way. It's a way we have evolved together with a lot, a lot of local national actors and a few high NGOs, and actually is just an interface between the outside system actors, affected individuals, groups, people, and then the system. And, and if I look at, for instance, Palestine, where protection groups, and they take the lead. When I talk about locally led here, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of on the, the, the far left of it, the radical one. It is leading, it is owning resources, it's owning the decision-making process. With us, only supporting, facilitating, connecting. It's surrendering power and seeing yourself exclusively as a facilitator. But what we see there, for instance, were um, I, so the survivor and community-led crisis response. I could say a lot of great things about it. Now you could keep me talking for an hour about it, but I won't. But I would never call it a protection tool as such. But what we do see come out of it when we allow that space for people to go in and make their own analysis, decide on priorities, and get access to then the resources and own the implementation. There's a lot of really interesting protection outcomes that, that, that comes with it in some places, in others less so, but it is a way of working that delivers to protection outcomes that probably would be difficult to get from an outside sort of intervention. Some of them in Palestine, just a few off the top of of my 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 head would be um, reduction in settler violence, documentation, and 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 reducing settler violence. It would be um, increasing the chances for girls or girls around um, puberty to continue to go to school. It would be awareness and referrals around domestic violence, gender-based violence within their communities. It was about securing the continued use of agricultural land that always would have been lost to, to Israeli settlers. And then during COVID, it was, it was really interesting to see where these groups already existed and already had that sort of kind of agency as just an extension of what they did. They would come in and really kind of safeguard the community when that community was being, was being let down by obviously the Israeli authorities big time, but even their own Palestinian authorities and NGOs couldn't access the communities. They were the ones who organized assistance to people most in need. They were the ones who stopped those who travel across to Israel and smuggle themselves back in and isolated them, but under, under, under decent um, um, but kept them away from taking a possible transmission back into, into the community. So a, a, a lot of things that happened there that also I think speaks back to at least a wider protection. So I'll, I kind of think I've said my piece and, and hand it back to you, Yama. Thanks, Nils. And as always, some very um, thoughtful and challenging, provoking, can I say, but it's good. It's, it's what we need as, a, as, as uh, those in the international community particularly. And I think it's a really good point on this standing back and don't get in the way. Um, and 
surrendering power, relinquish control. I mean, I think there's a lot of buzzwords for this in the system, but actually this is talking about, you know, what does it mean practically and allowing communities to work towards their own outcomes. And I think it's really these these sort of examples that you gave of sort of long-term negotiated peace markets um, and the extremely, you know, um, meaningful and, yeah, and, and huge protection outcomes they lead to, but that there was such a lack of awareness both within the humanitarian um, and peace community. And I guess that sort of leads us to that a bit of a challenge that maybe all the panellists can think about um, that I might, might put back to you in a sec uh, on, you know, how do we then deal with this? You know, it's been an over overwhelming sort of resounding call for granular local uh, analysis and delinking from this very sort of international programmatized, if I might say that, um, approach to programming, both within the peace and humanitarian sectors. And how do we get around that? Um, and what is needed for that uh, within our own organizations? But I assume there's also a bit of uh, up the up the chain of donors, etc. So maybe maybe you can have a think about that um, and and how. Can you I just your... say one thing to that? Yeah, I would actually course. challenge yeah. the, the the assumption that we need to have that. Yeah, it, it, I think that's where we go wrong. We we to a certain extent need to have it in the sense of you know, do do less harm, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But we should never think we can own a conflict sensitivity and analysis that is as up to speed as the one that sits on the shoulders of the persons who are living the crisis because this changes day and by the minute sometimes. So, so I think we should somehow be careful to make this assumption that we need this. I think, was it Mike or, or Lee that paid? No, I think it was Mike, the point about this. I mean, I think usually obsolete 60 page conflict analysis done by outsiders who by the end of it might understand a trifle of what really goes on in a country. Mm. Sorry, that, I'm just keeping up the good provocative mood. <laughs> Always happy for a provocative chat, Nils. <laughs> and I think we have a good uh, a, a good sort of um, set of panellists here that are very happy to engage in that. Maybe we've got a couple of uh, questions in the chat, um, particularly directed to you, Clement. Um, so maybe we can just pick a couple of those up. Um, and just again, if anybody has any questions, um, please do feel free to put them in in the chat now. Um, but Clement, um, there's, uh, I think there's a couple of questions that I can put together, one of which is sort of through the work that you've been doing, um, how you're ensuring that this sort of interaction between armed actors um, and communities aren't exposing uh, communities to retaliation uh, and threats. Um, and also perhaps you can answer a, a sort of a additional question on whether your work involves areas where non-state armed actors are um, and, and what the implications are for that for communities to, um, to, yeah, to ensure that they can um, have their own, um, yeah, that they can have a dialogue where they don't have retaliation from from state. So over to you. Okay, <clears throat> great. Okay, so we we must uh, highlight the difficulties that we have at the very beginning is that we couldn't have a, a, mis a misunderstanding uh, of the. Before the communities thing. and the role of the communities and the armed uh, groups. We have two kinds of uh, groups. We have the state-sponsored uh, armed groups and non-state armed groups. So, and you see the communications, the communities are caught uh, between these two groups because they don't really understand. They really don't understand the, the role uh, of these uh, armed groups because state-sponsored uh, armed groups are supposed to protect the communities. And, and we see that these very soldiers are committing these uh, offenses against the communities. And you see there's a gap between these uh, these concepts they have. Uh, for example, we have the soldiers in Niger who arrived on the ground and we have uh, uh, some women got raped and and they, they threatened the, the husbands. and and has rapes and threats. And you see, you can imagine the perception of that these communities had of this and 
And in some time, this state, uh, the government often said that communities were accomplice to these uh, non-state uh, armed uh, groups. And so we're working with these communities. And so we uh, established two communities, two com committees we call peace committees. And these committees have uh, members from various uh, um, social classes, from various members of the community. And we wanted to have a, a platform so the, the communities and the, the government, the military can talk about safety and security. And this group and this peace committee is really a community-based um, mechanism, a re resilience mechanism, so we can fight against this uh, perception. We I can actually have uh, strategies in order to strengthen this collaboration because we need to uh, so we need to work on this uh, we s what we do with civic it's not only that we we we, we train soldiers uh, about uh, how to, to to talk to interact with the communities but now we have a uh, high-ranking officers that need to be trained and we started to work with them and we started to work with the people on the ground and we also need to to tell them how to to teach them how to ensure the protection of uh, communities and can we achieve good, some good results and this is what we did in Niger and we try to uh, establish some indicators in order to uh, assess the uh, contribution and we're able to assess the hurdles and we be able to work with the armed groups so we can have a permanent activities and so these activities really give us enough strength to move forward. And as we said, we worked. So we worked with the Ministry of Youth, Ministry of Defense, Ministry of uh, Women's Conditions, and with the, uh, the civil society so we can work on the protection. And so thanks to Civic and all the elements uh, based on the protection of uh, civil society. We've been able to, to, to draft this uh, advocacy uh, guidebook, so we can actually have a, a count on the engagement of the communities, so we can have a legal framework which can be used uh, to protect these communities. So, you know, in the region, and uh, just two days ago, we had a uh, shootings and people got killed and um, this is uh, wrong for the community so we need to, 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 to engage with the communities so they can be resilient to face all the threats and all the risks. I don't know if we uh, be able to answer correctly to your questions. No, that's great. Thanks so much Clement and I think it really um, you know, it grounds it in how you're dealing with uh, with some of these really difficult uh, challenges and dilemmas. Perhaps, um, Mike, um, do you want to talk a little bit about sort of some of the challenges with acceptance of government vis-a-vis -vis non state armed groups, particularly where you're working uh, and supporting communities in in areas where obviously there's a, a presence of both and some dilemmas and challenges there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and thanks for the question, Gemma, and those who, who raised it in the chat. I mean, it's an, an enormous uh, element to, to think through for, for search, um, not only for our, ourselves, but all, all the, the people we support and, and the communities we support, um, both in terms of uh, illegal, uh, the legal framework that the colleague from Minusca highlighted, Minusma highlighted, as well as the risk of harm and, and reprisals. In our experience, in both from the, the host country government, but in many cases also from international governments, uh, the U.S. government, the um, UN, and and, uh, um, and some of the other systems um, that, that also issue their own sort of terror um, declarations and things. Um, I, we would, I would say our experience varies, extra, ex, is extraordinarily different from place to place, um, and often uh, a much more helpful uh, conversation where we try to drive it is, is not sort of dialogue or not dialogue. Um, our, our name is Search for Common Ground. We have a particular opinion on whether or not dialogue is useful, um, but it's usually about which group um, is involved and about what. 
and dividing between sort of access negotiations, you know, humanitarian access negotiations from other um, you know, other kinds of political solutions and so forth. Um, everywhere we work, we do uh, at Search work with the clear communication with the state um, about what we're doing, as well as with the UN system. Um, we find that to be an approach um, that's important so as not to trigger unintended consequences and reprisals from the state against the communities that we work with. Um, and so we generally don't do things in, in sort of secret or without state um, uh, part, or without at least a, a clear line of communication to the state. Um, in places where, um, uh, in, in many places, that's been welcomed by the state. In some cases, there's concerns that participating in a process uh, with an armed group, that an armed group participates in a process confers legitimacy on them. Um, in other cases, um, both the national governments and the international community have appreciated the kinds of NGO-led, civil society-led efforts we lead, explicitly because it doesn't confer legitimacy, um, because we're just, you know, at the end of the day, we, we're not a government, um, and, and therefore don't confer recognition um, over control of a particular piece of territory. In some, in some ways, these community-based um, efforts can be either useful precursors or parallels uh, to whatever more formal processes uh, governments might be uh, be envisioning, and in some ways can be quite useful, um, be especially particularly because they're not they're not legitimate and they don't bring um, the force of recognition. Um, but in areas where uh, governments um, or the political situation is just not appropriate um, for direct engagement with armed groups. Um, or the from the government side, or the um, or frankly the armed group side, two out, two things that we found to be particularly useful. One is around um, you know the peace committee structures, the early warning to make sure that you're involving people with influence over armed group behavior who are not necessarily armed group members themselves, not necessarily the senior, most senior most people within armed groups themselves. So in um, in some places, it's it's pastors, it's traditional leaders, it's uh, in some cases the school teacher, the the former rebel, uh, the the armed group leaders, school teacher and and mentor and other you know. And so we've had a lot of examples of of sort of support to civilians with uh, uh, who are not affiliated formally with an armed group but have ability to influence. Um, uh, but that that ability to influence is the main ticket, uh, is the ticket to entry in in some ways into to a lot of these processes. Um, um, and then the second, I would just really underscore also the ability, particularly now in the post-COVID world, um, of engagement via um, uh, online means, you know, is increasingly common, even in, in many of the, the crisis-affected places uh, where we um, work. So in areas um, under group control or with um, engagements, you know, via WhatsApp, um, for example, um, in many different societies, we've organized um, meetings uh, during COVID via Zoom um, between people who would never um, would be able to safely meet in person um, across zones of control or, or where the, the, the risk of physical participation is so high um, to be able to use Zoom platforms and others to engage. So I think there are a number of creative ways that uh, can be uh, and appropriate things that should be done even where um, the direct engagement with armed groups in a physical setting aren't necessar isn't necessarily um, uh, viable. Thanks so much for that, um, Mike. And maybe we can, maybe I can hand over to uh, Wendy to talk a little bit more um, about how Civic think through, um, you know, sort of complementary approaches between, um, you know, sort of considering engagement with state and non-state uh, actors and and entry points uh, for for that. Over to you, Wendy. Thanks so much, Gemma. So many great points raised by colleagues here. Maybe just a word on um, some of these questions that are coming up around how to, you know, support these locally led approaches in a way that um, is not only sort of context specific, is empowering local actors, um, but also builds in space for complementarity of approaches. So one of the things that we found um, in, in our work and especially in testing um, this toolkit is that identifying the correct entry points from government departments to parliaments to military bodies um, with very clear, practical and well-tailored recommendations um, matched to exactly those specific audiences really raise the 
the um, the prospects for success of dialogue and sustained dialogue. Um, there are a number of uh, good practice good practices which can help um, advance those efforts. So, for example, stakeholder mapping, um, you know, ha having sort of some of these key uh, messages that are very clear tying the engagement to a long-term advocacy strategy uh, as well, and considering the timing of some of these interventions. So, for example, bringing um, CSO priorities forward when there are large political changes um, can really make a big difference. And making sure you choose that moment of intervention um, that can really provide the right momentum for advocacy carefully. As the Clement was saying in the case of Niger, they really, you know, tried to identify political windows in which the prospects for success um, were more likely. Now, with our uh, non-state groups, obviously the engagement uh, has to uh, be adapted. Um, in these cases, you know, these complementary approaches can are, are really necessary. So on one level, you know, engaging with um, state security forces, also with legal, political and justice sectors, um, where you may not find traction, for example, um, with uh, the military, you may um, with the National Human Rights Commission or um, with justice entities, especially on transitional justice um, issues, um, but also in tandem, making sure that you support some of these community based mechanisms, um, including uh, you know, some of the examples that, that Nils raised were, were quite powerful, um, where, you know, we have to be very humble about our roles sometimes, um, not only making sure that we apply a sort of do no harm approach ourselves, building in, um, you know, measures to mitigate the risk of reprisals for um, engaging with local actors. Um, but making sure that where there are local systems, that they can be empowered to the extent possible. So, for example, um, community-based protection mechanisms, early warning networks, um, community alert networks um, are all examples of ways that we can support which we may not be the best placed actor uh, to support some of these um, local. Uh, thank you. Thanks very much, um, Wendy. And I think, you know, I think there's what I've heard today um, and actually through um, much of the week for those that have been uh, participating is, you know, that that need for very humble, very sort of granular um, community led um, localized sort of analysis pre any support. Um, we're running out of time, but just want to give um, all the panelists to, an opportunity to come back in. If you'd like, um, don't feel that you have to. Um, and I'll just go around quickly in the order uh, that we spoke to. So, you know, if you wanted to give, you know, one takeaway, and I know you've given us a lot of food for thought today, um, but, you know, one action that you think humanitarian and peace actors need to think about when considering community engagement, or one further point um, that you don't feel that has been adequately raised today, um, just to give you an opportunity to sort of, um, yeah, to, to come back in before we finish. So, Lee, I'll, I'll, I'll go around in the order that speakers came in on. Um, so, Lee, have you got one point that you'd want us to think about? Um, I think, for me, the, the sort of striking thing was thinking about the these parameters of engagement set by these conditions. Um, I think, that, as we said, that external support, you know, it, it can, can help to build capacity. It can, it can strengthen, uh, you know, civilians, um you know ability to engage but it's it's also thinking about what's often referred to as wartime conditions that that really set the boundaries of this and it's really thinking about what's feasible in terms of group ideology uh you know this motivation behind the use of violence and taking those into consideration and thinking about okay what is actually feasible in terms of you know how we support um community-led um, strategies because i think at times you know th there are severe limits in terms of what can actually be achieved. Great, thanks. Lee, Wendy, over to you. Uh, maybe I'll just to uh, pick up on that point and stress the need for a, a really this holistic, multi-pronged approach where we're looking for wherever possible trying to create that enabling environment and, and, um, and support the momentum and prospects for national commitments uh, while working also at the operational uh, level for preventing and mitigating 
harm and building in and supporting efforts um, to mitigate against civilian harm sort of responses. And, you know, right throughout the, the, the harm cycle, including, and this often does drop off, you know, or is left to sort of peace building actors later working on these issues around amends and, 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 um, and reparations. Uh, and in order to do that, as we've heard from almost everyone today, we really do have to find, um, you know, ways to work together that is, you know, much more cohesive. There's so many examples of good practice out there that we can build on. Uh, uh, so let's reach across the island and do so. Thanks. Thanks. Clement, over to you. Okay, merci bien. Uh, Thank you. We need to say that community engagement is uh, essential for protection and in the response to bring for us. We will uh, use the assessment, the toolkit that Civic has developed to create opportunities, uh, for example, to work with social society on the importance of protecting civilians. We want to avoid ethnic division uh, in the workplace and we also want to cover uh, communication matters. It's something that is very important that we want to develop. We want to work on advocacy as well for um, laws. And it's something we really have at heart. We are in a um, chaotic situation. So each time when we hear there are dead people, it really hurts. So we need to have a legal text that protects civilians, no matter the circumstance. Thank you very much. Sorry, <laughs> thanks so much, Mike, over to you. Thanks, yeah, I mean, I think we talked a little bit about the importance and practicality of community engagement, um, but what I underscore is fundamentally, it's also about power and it's about the the power and the influence that members of communities have over the kinds of outcomes that, that shape their societies. And often we look at the same uh, forest, uh, but we see the trees and not the animals, or we see the, the fish and not the birds or whatever, um, but we're not really understanding systems of, of power in these societies and, and the ability to move things uh, for good or for bad that, that um, civilians have. It's very easy, it's, it's appropriate to look directly at, at the engagement of armed groups and at the same time also understand that the influence over armed groups isn't just the, the commanders themselves or the, the, the leader. It's, you know, it's the association of, of women in the market who choose or negotiate whether to pay taxes or not. It's the kid who has 10,000 followers on WhatsApp uh, in, in the, the chat he leads. It's uh, not the religious leader, it's his deputy that the, you know, it's his young deputy that the, the gang members listen to um, and so forth. And if we're not, if we're closed, it doesn't mean the humanitarian international communities understand it, but it does mean we need to support those, the people who work with those kinds of people to shift, um, shift the dynamics, to shift the, the outcomes um, and the protection outcomes in that, that society. And the degree to which we across sectors, but also in a way that's much more um, synced between local and global are using platforms um, and learning from one another through uh, initiatives like Connexus um, and others. I think the, the better we'll all be um, at understanding and harnessing the different forms of power uh, and aligning um, international power behind uh, the influence for, for good um, that exists within, uh, uh, within communities. Over. Great, thanks. Kieran, over to you. Thanks. Um, so I think for me and for my colleagues at Save the Children, I think the important thing is is really for us to be prepared and to be structured for timely actions, right? Um, when can we be locally led versus, you know, when, when do um, kind of external actors, including ourselves, have the most kind of value add when can we bear more responsibility take on more risks and be there for communities in the ways that communities want us to be there for them and how do we how do we find this uh this space across kind of humanitarian actors human rights actors peace building at community uh peace making at the highest political level so you know as humanitarians and as child rights actors save the children you know and our work on protection for us 
we we would really like to see the protection of civilians working across all of those environments, you know, across that nexus of humanitarian development and and peace building. But really what we're expecting is much more participation even at the at the highest levels of peacemaking, because that's what's going to hold perpetrators of conflict to account. We've seen very uh, significant steps forward on women's participation in peace processes, but you know we are missing. We can't just put on on women to represent the interests of children. We need to be looking at specific categories because if we look at it from the point of view of communities, you know, as a member of a community myself, I don't want to be siloed off on humanitarian concerns or development concerns or or peacemaking. While those are important channels for the bureaucrats communities affected by conflict just want to see solutions. And I think that's, it's really incumbent upon us, therefore, to be prepared, to be structured for those timely actions, and to really think about what we need to do in order to preserve humanitarian space for humanitarian action, but also what we can share with others in order to to give energy to, to kind of peacemaking actions and inform that much more. I'll stop there. Thanks. Thanks. And Nils, over to you before we go to Sara to wrap up. Thanks. I think, I think and, and an important point here is, is this thing about, yes, the, the relationship between what we do and what we do particularly as externals. And I, I think the whole, a lot of it comes down to just, do we need to continue to use these very extractive tools where we go in and extract analysis? Or should we just see, wouldn't we learn just as much by enabling people to make their own analysis, their own assessments, their own priority settings, and then just listen in together with local national partners, et cetera. But just, to, I think this sort of, we have this super bad, I think, habit in, but I think probably both in the humanitarian and in the peace community and development to a certain extent too, that of doing extractive assessments know that we can do a lot better and be a lot wiser and thus enable and empower people instead of extract analysis. Um, then I'd say on, on community-led protection, obviously, I mean, yes, I'm there wholeheartedly with all the caveats that we need to bring into place. And I said before, some of these more ex sort of extreme or radical versions that we're uh, suggesting I don't see that as protection programming as such, but be very open to the fact that it will probably deliver to protection. In most cases, it, it has. And give you a kind of feedback on what your own programming, more protection programming might be missing out on and get some new ideas. So just sort of play the ball back and the resources back to groups in a responsible manner and you'll just see your own work and, your, and not least your own staff be enriched by that experience. And then just lastly, when it comes to conflict transformation and, and, and peace work, I, I still hold some respect for a bit of a siloed approach. At least in some of the cases I've seen, I, I do still think that there's a value that some of the conflict transformation people I know, the way they work, it sits better slightly in parallel with and, and deeply informed by humanitarian actors, but not necessarily there. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> with our very few minutes left, and we might run one minute, two minutes over time, um, but just because we've got two minutes left, I'll quickly hand to Sarah um, Brod, who is the Senior Protection Advisor from the Swedish International Development Agency, for some final points before we close. Sarah, over to you, and sorry there's so little time. Thank you very much, Gemma, and thank you to all of you. This has been an excellent discussion, and I don't know what I can add to this discussion, uh, but thank you for letting Sida coming in on this. Um, even when prefer preparing for this event, I realized that we don't speak in, uh, enough with each other internally at CEDA. We have, a, we have a humanitarian strategy with the goal of reducing risk of violence, threats and abuse for crisis affected people. And the strategy is being implemented in 21 major crises at the moment and in other crises as well. And from the humanitarian side, we do what we can to support actions that mitigate threats, reduce vulnerabilities and enhance capacities for self-protection to reach protection outcomes. At the same time, 
uh, several of CEDA's just over 40 strategies are covering the area of inclusive societies. And although they, not, they do not express this in terms of contributing to protection outcomes, of course they are. So I think there are many things that we can learn from this session uh, as a donor. We need definitely to start and continue to discuss how humanitarian protection and peace communities can work in greater collaboration and complementarity towards supporting communities for self-protection. And I think among other things, um, Communities can be supported in their engagements with threats to increase their protection. And as we have heard today, a people-centered and inclusive approach is needed. And that really puts the communities and their protection at the heart of discussion and engagement. I think we need to learn from our partners and enable uh, them to work in a way that puts people at the center. And this can include keeping in mind that communities need to be involved when defining protection. Who decides? what protection is or when you feel safe. Communities also need to be involved in the definition of what is harmful trade-off and what their risks may be. And I think at CEDA and in line with Sweden's humanitarian strategy through CEDA, we are testing and developing several tools to support our partners in this important task. We, are test we have flexible funding, uh, multi-year humanitarian funding, and currently we are exploring ways of localizing the humanitarian response. But we also work with partners um, on how to meaningfully measure protection outcomes and moving away from focusing only at, uh, at how many people have been reached. But we need to do more to encourage joint contextualized analysis with communities and to help development, peace and humanitarian partners to have a common understanding that can support coordination and synergies when possible. I think that shorter and long-term investments should complement each other to enhance sustainability, trust and relationship building to make these activities possible. And I can just finish by underlying that we need to better learn and understand when external actors can help um, and when involvement can do uh, more harm than good through listening and empowering local actors and communities. That came out very clearly today. Um, I think we can also aim at better understanding of how our pr protection interventions can contribute to peace positive factors beyond making sure that they are not aggravating conflicts. Thank you very much for an excellent session. Thanks so much, Sarah. And just to say, I know we're um, out of time. I'm not even going to attempt to wrap up what's been such a rich conversation. Um, thanks to everyone for all the messages on the chat. And thank you so much to all of our panelists for a really interesting um, and you know, um, challenging and uh, in-depth uh, discussion. There's been a lot in the chat, um, but please feel free to reach out to us um, to to take forward that conversation. Um, but thanks again um, and invite you all. Our Twitter handle is at HPG ODI, um, but feel free to get in contact. Um, have a good day.